thank you for tuning in to the Meaning of Everything podcast, where we take a fresh look at who we are as a species to attempt to transform our lives and communities for the better. Now, today is episode 11, and I'm feeling super stoked. I know I say this a lot, but I'm definitely feeling super stoked. The guest we have on is Tyler Tully, who is a scholar here at Oxford and who has taken a really magnificent journey from, well, you'll see. Uh, But he started out in the Bible Belt as a young kid, and now he's a critical post-secular, post-trauma, post-everything scholar, and he's brilliant. Uh, Tyler is actually a good friend of mine. We met here as doctoral students, and I became instantly fascinated by his perspective because while he and I are in the same field, we're both in science and religious studies, he brings a very lived experience to the field, having been deeply immersed in traditional religion in the States and very conservative uh, religion in the States. And also, of course, is now here at Oxford and studying cognitive science and evolutionary biology and has a really deep understanding of how people sort of are immersed in in both of those worlds and what we need in order in order to bridge the gaps. And so we will in a few minutes be talking with Tyler a lot about his journey, a lot about what the world needs in terms of um, our spirituality and our ability to uh, be educated about science while at the same time engaging spirituality and most importantly of all just really understand the life of uh, growing up in, in a very religious world and being exposed to all sorts of new and I think often, at least initially, scary, scary ideas. So we will be talking with Tyler about that. I want to read you his bio. It's very impressive, very impressive. Um, Tyler M. Tully is an American writer, religionist, and theologue whose work has been featured in sources such as the Bulletin for the Study of Religion, the Journal for the Study of Religion, Nature and Culture, and Al Jazeera Media. A distinguished graduate of Our Lady of the Lake University with a BA in Religious Studies and Theology, Tyler later earned a Master of Divinity at, with distinction at the Chicago Theological Seminary in Hyde Park, where his constructive theology thesis explored cognition and animal sacrifices in the Hebrew Bible. Tully is the Arthur Peacock Scholar in Theology and Science at Exeter College, Oxford, completing his doctoral research under the supervision of Donovan O. Schaefer, brilliant man, and Professor Graham Ward, also brilliant. His research interests lay at the intersection of science and religion, embodiment and trauma studies, and critical theories of race, place, and ecology. Uh, So uh, we will be bringing on Tyler in a minute. Do I have anything to share about my life? Episode 11, this is probably coming out around the new year. That's uh, really, really exciting. Happy, happy holidays, happy new year. I'm recording these boatloads in advance. Um, so I'm, I'm not quite there yet. I'll be really interested to hear. I'll be posting on social media and the like, uh, how you feel about the concept of resolutions. If you think it's useful, if it's been useful for you, what you're planning for yourself. I personally, quick aside here, last year decided to be celibate on New Year's. It was a few days before New Year's that I made the decision and I had just been fed up. There was a straw on the camel's back, so to speak, of my, uh, trouble interacting with and, and dating and, and all those sorts of things. And really being done, investing so much emotional energy and really struggling, really struggling, experiencing uh, loss and longing. And really, I tried very hard to make things work when maybe what I really needed to do was just focus on my life and let things unfold. Uh, naturally and and try less hard to sort of find a a romantic life. And this was especially important as I was about to turn 30. And anyway, it ended up being an enormous success. And this was the first time in my life I ever made a New Year's resolution. And I learned a ton about it. And I'm currently planning on writing about it. And maybe around this time, I will have posted it somewhere. You're gonna have to check on social media because again, right now it's, it's way too far in advance to know, but I definitely had a lot of really interesting stories in my year of celibacy, which stopped being celibate uh, near the end. But 
I, I, I would love to share more about that with you and would love to hear more about your stories. So that's a bit about my life. I want to get to Tyler. Um, so as always, you can find us, find this on YouTube and iTunes. And if you have suggestions for different kinds of media for me to be on, please do let me know or any other suggestions. You can email TMO everything at gmail.com. Okay. Okay. Hi. So this is Tyler. Tyler, welcome. Hi. Thanks for having me. Yeah. Thank you so much. I just spent several minutes talking about how lucky I am to know you. <laughs> well, I feel the same. You know that. I appreciate yeah. you inviting me on here. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. So uh, I, unfortunately, I actually don't know all that. I actually don't know all that much about your research and I actually don't know all that much about how you got here, but I've always been fascinated in it. And so if you could give us a little bit of a primer on like what you're doing here, what you're up to and, mm -hmm. and why, you know, why, why is this, why is this your question or why is this your set of questions? Well, that's a big question. Uh, <laughs> and it's a great one to start with though, isn't it? Um, yeah. So like you, uh, I'm doing a doctorate uh, in religious studies uh, in the Faculty of Theology and Religion here at the University of Oxford. And also like you, uh, my subfield is in religion and science, um, which is sort of a strange thing because I did not expect um, years ago when I started on this tra trajectory that I would end up in something like religion and science, studying the things that I'm studying and the way that I'm studying them. Um, to back up a little bit, I come from Oklahoma. Uh, I'm from Oklahoma City. Uh, more specifically, Moore, Oklahoma, which is a uh, suburb of Oklahoma City, which is sort of known for two things. One, uh, we're the home of the largest tornadoes ever in recorded history, uh, both of them. Um, okay. And we're also home to world famous Toby Keith, country western singer. Um, so that's sort of our claim to fame, if you will. Okay. But uh, I grew up there in an evangelical community, um, which is, you know, like a book in like waiting all by itself someday. Like I'll work through all that trauma and eventually put that on paper. But that was extremely formative for me growing up. My mom was a school teacher um, at a, a evangelical Christian school where my sisters and I attended. Uh, and this, uh, this context is, is very much like many other evangelical communities in the United States, which sort of have a particular bent on um, what's been called a dominionist uh, outlook of Christianity in relation to the secular government. And what that means is um, they sort of adopt this history or story of the United States being um, created as a city on the hill or as sort of like a light to the nations, a new Israel um, sort of in a messianic way that, that Christianity came, uh, true Christianity came to the United States and flourished here. And so it's the job of Christians to sort of maintain balance and justice and holiness in the world by um, having like the right sort of morals and uh, by standing up for the right kinds of values. And these things usually translate into uh, anything from gun rights to uh, being pro-life um, and heterosexual uh, relationships, those sorts of things, those power dynamics are all intimately woven into this sort of like culture. Um, and that's really what I was kind of steeped in uh, growing up. And, and the, sort of, the sort of teaching and uh, communal like knowledge production that's involved there is a whole like subfield of research in and of itself. There's uh, people who are uh, usually men that are that are um, really popular, like in some of those circuits, uh, and they just travel like from megachurch to megachurch, teaching on specific like topics and apologetics, like why creationism is the only reasonable thing in the world, and like why evolution is satanic, and and you know it's a part of the gay agenda and all this stuff, right? Like like there's people who like literally make a living doing this sort of thing, uh, and so I grew up like spending time like. Um, being a part of these like uh, Christian clubs um, that uh, are really good at like facilitating and fostering like a sense of community uh, for the children of these like uh, 
you know, evangelical like communities and mega churches. Um, but we're, we're, we also get these like parachuted uh, in uh, visitations from these guys on circuit, you know, so, so, you know, like on Sunday night, we'll have um, these guys uh, demonstrating, you know, why like humans lived at the same time as dinosaurs and why this is crucial to the, the culture wars. Um, and it just really sort of like, is this odd, but like strangely logical, like way of like, looking and operating in the world mm -hmm. um and when you're kind of caught up in that like i was like diet in the wool um it really shapes the way that you look behave sound uh in the world and it sort of gives you this sense of like purpose in uh retaking america for jesus for evangelical jesus and um really narrows the scope of how you look at things and where you look and what you don't look at. So um, I never imagined that I'd be at a place like Oxford studying re religion and science and sort of the relationships between the two. Um, but in a weird way, it sort of makes sense because uh, having grown up in that culture, um, the more that I got exposed to what life was like outside of those mega church complexes, a story that I like to tell, um, involves how she was treated at this uh, at this uh, place of employment. She um, had a certificate in teaching. She had a bachelor bachelor's degree, and and uh, for all intents and purposes, uh, should have been um, an honored and esteemed member of the teaching community, like all of the teachers there. But unfortunately, because she was female, um, she was paid less than her male colleagues because, um, according to their particular of evangelicalism they believed that the men were the head of the households and so they were responsible uh, to provide for their families whereas the women were just helpers uh, to the husbands so um, although my dad worked too um, they justified not paying my mom as much because of her gender right and this never really sat well with me and to be fair it didn't sit well with my mom either but um, I was happy to find out a couple of years ago that they actually changed their policy um, I don't know whether that was because of a threat from uh, the state government or whether that was out of the kindness of their hearts, um, if you will. But uh, there were there were lots of experiences that I had like that where I just didn't buy um, the power dynamic. Um, it just bothered me, and I wasn't satisfied with the answers. And I felt that sometimes um, those the questions were couched in such a way as not to undermine the answers in the first place, you know, so uh, you, you were taught to undermine uh, and to be critical of the culture around you, but you weren't allowed to really turn that in on yourself. So that's sort of my rude and weird introduction to critical theory later, you know, like right. just being sort of aware of these inconsistencies, like in, um, the epistemy that I was already in and then sort of like trying to process that and make sense of it in my own way, mm -hmm. along with all these different experiences of friends that I had, um, you know, and loved ones like my mom, queer friends that I had, um, friends of color that just had the worst time imaginable in environments like that. Um, as you can imagine, because, um, I mean, these things involve all kinds of, power dynamics and race and sexuality and um, class. And uh, I saw the contours of those things, but I, I couldn't make sense of them because I didn't have the experience or the language for it. And um, I think that, uh, I think that in a weird way that sort of primed like the pump for me to um, start this academic journey to find those answers and to find ways of looking and analyzing and like critiquing um, those experiences and that's that's sort of uh the ancient impetus that i had in uh, coming into academia it's it's very interesting to me that what you you speak about the things that made you start to question you know the world that you were in mm -hmm. in terms of power and the things you noticed were injustices which i find mm -hmm. really interesting because normally when we talk about these when people have these kinds of narratives they say well the hell thing doesn't make sense or the creation story has 
you know, with the, these certain ways that it doesn't work with science or X, Y, and Z ways. And people are usually talking about the metaphysics, talking about the beliefs. Yeah. Uh, but you're talking, you sort of, the injustices of it all is, is really interesting to me that that's what you saw and that has followed you throughout your, throughout your career trajectory. Because even now you do religion and science, but it's very much focused on issues of justice, yeah? Yeah, I mean, and injustice is a term that I use, like, if we even want to peel that back another layer, um, for me, it was always about bodies, you know, mm -hmm. like, um, I think I, I told you before, I'm a child abuse survivor, and growing up in that environment, I endured, um, you know, child abuse for 18 years of my life, and so for me, the justice issue was connected to the fairness, uh, to the unfairness, and to the um, like maltreatment of people's bodies. And I started to see uh, within my own experience um, the ways that other bodies were being marked and harmed. Mm -hmm. um, and I saw that this happened in a lot of different ways. You know, like sometimes it was through the policing of uh, what people could wear and what people could talk about and what people could read. Um, in other ways, it was um, what everyone did but couldn't talk about you know when it came to like issues of sexuality for example um everybody was human just like anyone else with uh different types of experiences and yet um there were very well-defined strictures about what counted and what didn't count as um you know holy uh, and so the i didn't buy that because um i saw the harm that it did right and and so it's it didn't make sense to me to hold up, you know, these lofty ideals of things like, um, you know, rightness and uh, being on the right side of history and God and, and righteous and holy and all the language that you use growing up in evangelical land, but uh, also seeing the way that people um, were so harmed and the people that were harmed were usually the people that were the most vulnerable. You know, like when I, when I noticed that, uh, the people making the rules and enforcing the rules and benefiting from the rules were usually part of the same class and gender and sexual orientation and performance um, and race. Uh, it all started to click for me, right? And so I, w I wanted to really understand that dynamic more about why I felt much more of a solidarity with um, women who had been mistreated or uh, I grew up uh, as a Native American but coded as white and I was uh, never really privy to that uh, side of my culture uh, whatsoever. Um, and if anything, it was kind of couched as something to be embarrassed of, fetishized at best. Um, and I just wondered, like, why do I feel like this strange, um, why, did, why is what they're saying making more sense to me than these unsatisfying um, ways of being in the world that I see from, you know, the powerful? Um, and, and when one's a child, like, I think everything seems powerless to you, but it seemed especially powerless to me as a survivor. Um, and so I, alongside this, and this was sort of my entry into science and religion as a subfield in my master's, um, I started taking trauma theory very seriously and working through uh, not only my own trauma uh, as uh, surviving child abuse, but also in, in seeing how unfortunately normal trauma is in life and in society. Uh, and in bodies and how that um, plays out in so many different ways, not only in the healing process, um, which never looks the same for anyone, but also just in, in the ways that we, we make meaning and make sense of what's happening in our bodies and what's happening in the world. Um, and so for me, that's really kind of the lens that I look at, um, you know, like I work in um, science and religion, religion and ecology. And, you know, when you say these things out loud, like they really sound um, so formal and like really alien from some of the things that we've been talking. But for me, it's always been about embodied experience, right? Like that's sort of where like um, there's this uh, critical juncture between uh, the scientific part and the religious part because we're dealing with power, we're dealing with knowledge, we're dealing with experience, but we're also dealing with the way that the world is and the way uh, that our bodies are not only mediums like in the world, but are like places of import uh, that are like, like undivorceable from those, 
you know, scientific things in the world. We're, we're like plugged into it. We can't get away from it. Mm-hmm. Um, and so it really challenged sort of some of the dualisms that I grew up in where like, you know, the spirit and the afterlife and all this stuff is like out there somewhere. Um, what I love about the research that I do and in the research that other people do um, involving these sorts of conversations is that um, it really emphasizes that we don't have bodies, but we are bodies. Right. And like every experience that we have is embodied. Um, and I love that. And I love expl- exploring that and, and, and investigating and pushing it as far as I can. Mm. You know, the there's always been, I think, this misconception about religion, that it's something that's supposed to make us feel good. You know, <laughs> yeah. right. Like because especially if you talk to secular people, though, often mm-hmm. people will often say, uh, well, they're religious because they're afraid of these things, right? Mm-hmm. They're afraid of dying, and so they're religious, or or what have you. And this has been like a long tradition in the in the study of religion, theorizing it in this way, and and it's a popular conception today. But it was a really important lesson for me to learn, and of course, I had to learn it in a book because I didn't practice religion growing up or study it at all. Yeah, uh, that religions can be traumatic experiences and this isn't to say that they're necessarily traumatic but rather that trauma is everywhere can be everywhere right and yeah. and, and manifest everywhere but i am wondering is is there something unique about trauma that is related to religion you yeah, know for or, me definitely uh yeah so i mean first of all because it involves the body right and um i spoke a little bit uh, just there about some of the dualisms that I grew up with. Um, one of the things that I learned to appreciate through trauma studies um, is that every quote unquote spiritual or religious experience I had growing up always involved the body, right? Like anyone that I could think of, like even the most like strangely aesthetic ones, like fasting, praying, singing, revelations, dreams, uh, worship, whatever all these things involved the body Mm -hmm. and it makes no sense to try to articulate some sort of experience or reality that's religious or spiritual that's not embodied right and that to me kind of cracked it all open you know like we keep trying to um my experience you know thinking of my past experiences in in, uh, evangelicalism um we kept trying to like police the body um, downplay embodied experience because the whole point was like to get the new body in heaven and to like get there and out of this world is like whenever we could, um, like that time would come and you'd always like want it and long for it. Um, but to me that was like extremely dissatisfying, but it was also extremely convenient, uh, to dismiss like the embodied experiences of people here and now. Right. Mm. And so, like, like you mentioned, I mean, I, I think religion, um, both by its supporters and its critics, is used much too often as either like the world's biggest scapegoat or the world's biggest panacea. And I don't think it's either, really. I think a more critical and nuanced look at religion is that we're just inherently religious as creatures, you know, and like what we call religions, what I like to say, small r religion. Um, is much more common than what we associate it to be. You know, it, it's something that I appreciated more when I came over here uh, to the UK. And perhaps it's because they have a long history of uh, state church and there's not this strict, um, or even like the idea of a strict wall between church and state. But when you speak about religion and, and religious studies here, they typically assume and associate it with things like, uh, you know, like being in church and in high church and, and reading, um, you know, from the Book of Common Prayer and doing these sorts of like liturgies and whatnot. And while that is religious, right, like that doesn't really encapsulate everything that religion is or can be, right? Um, so I like to point out, for instance, you know, like this morning, uh, I was working with some of my undergrads uh, and we were talking about Durkheim's collective effervescence, right? Like, okay, can you can you explain that? <laughs> yeah, just unpack it. So this guy Durkheim, um, which is extremely, he was an extremely influential uh, person in the study of religion. Um, he talked about how, um, you know, at its core, we could strip away um, religious experience uh, down to what he called collective effervescence, 
right? This like sort of like bubbling up that happens when bodies are brought together. And when I read Durkheim here, I can't help but think of the 1990s movie Fight Club with Brad Pitt and Edward Norton, right? Because like Brad Pitt, I grew up in Oklahoma and we were very much exposed to like this religious um, evangelicalism or I should say evangelicalisms that takes uh, all kinds of, uh, you know, embodies itself in all kinds of different ways. Um, the type that he grew up in was very charismatic. And, and once he was doing a, like a voiceover commentary for Fight Club, and he was talking about how um, when he grew up uh, in charismatic circles, when people, like when bodies would just get together and near each other, there was this collective effervescence. You know, I, I'm using Durkheim's language, he wasn't. Um, there was a sort of like a elect electricity in the air and, and sort of this like anticipation for something exciting that was about to happen. And that can boil over, right? Like uh, with my students here who are typically European and in English uh, more likely, um, I use soccer as a great example. You know, like when you go into the stadium, like they're singing songs, they're wearing the same colors. Um, they have the same triggers. Uh, for, um, you know, excitement and for hope and for despair. Um, and, you know, like if we look at that in a more common, more commonly small R religious way, I think it starts to demonstrate just how creaturely religion can be, right? Like it doesn't have to be um, something that is uh, lofty and, you know, extremely refined uh, in the ways that we usually associate it to be. So that's a really long segue into, you know, talking about like why religion and religious studies, like I think has the potential to unlock all these sorts of conversations that bleed over into each other, right? Like we've talked about power dynamics, which inevitably involve, uh, you know, sociological uh, aspects, political aspects. It involves all kinds of sites of the body, gender, age, sexuality, culture, like the, the type of language that we're using, the symbolism that we're using, but it also involves these effective embodied uh, dimensions too, right? Like sort of what Durkheim's alluding to there with this uh, collective effervescence. And that's what I love about the study of religion because using that in a constructive way um, can get you through all sorts of helpful methodologies that are already established in academia, but it can also invite um, you to appreciate just how complicated and yet simple we are as creatures. Hmm. Yeah, it's, it's the question of, I spend so much time blabbering at my audience about what religion is. The question <laughs> of what religion is, it's like all, it's, it's, it's pretty much what I do. It's really interesting because I think the only, the only solutions are to say everybody is religious or nobody is religious mm -hmm. because, because we're all human and we have this category that we like to throw on particular kinds of experiences, but it's just, it's so complicated. And I think there's a reason that, you know, after the category of religion was invented mm -hmm. and people theorized about it for hundreds of years, like nobody agrees yet. <laughs> you know? right. yeah. Yeah. It, it, there's 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 definitely definitely a reason and there's been all these studies of course you know about football activating the same regions of the brain as religion and mm -hmm. um that that's all very fascinating to me i have i have however i'm posing this to you and i'm sorry this is a bit of a tangent but the <laughs> i think what's perhaps distinct between religion and something like soccer is for me the fact that the kinds of power that are leveraged intentionally often but not always in religion have an existential level of power or promise mm -hmm. right so you're being promised things like the afterlife or salvation or remediation of your guilt or, or whatever you know you're, you're being promised something that has a very deeply existential hook and that's why i think religions are so hard to break into and get out of you know and that's why mm -hmm. it's not the only reason because there's a lot of social stuff involved with it but uh but it's also i think it's not altogether irrelevant and especially when we're looking at communities like the kind that you came from you know how 
I'm always, you're always thinking about power. I'm always thinking about power. This is why we study with <laughs> the same group of people. But huh. the, there is so much power in religions. And I think this existential piece is unique. But it is, it's an interesting way to look at it. And I don't think we think enough about power as a culture. And, you know, the different kinds of power and the different ways that they... Mm -hmm that they can affect us. I can turn this into a question. So, <laughs> um, well, you know what, like if I could just jump in the, the conversation that we're having about soccer, I think also has an existential dimension to it. Mm. Uh, for example, there is a hope, not just of winning, but of like next year's team. Right. And this sort of, um, transmutes from season to season. It's like trans historical, really like, you know, here in Britain, as in the United States, uh, you may grow up like a part of a family or neighborhood or community where you just support one team, you know, and like that is like who you hang out with to like grill on Sundays with. That's who you go to the pub with, you know, for the games on Saturdays or in the middle of the week. And you always have this like anticipatory hope for what could or might happen. You're not guaranteed anything. I mean, ask any Cubbies fan, like whether like they're guaranteed the World Series the next year, they're not. And that's what I think drives like the existential element of these things. It's like, there are still like Pittsburgh Pirate fans. Like, I'm sorry to my Pittsburgh friends, but like, you know, like you don't have to always be like a uh, Dallas Cowboy or you know, a Manchester United fan, coincidentally, they're not doing very well the last several seasons to like, you know, jump on a bandwagon. Like, I think we typically start to look at these things as just a commodity or just as sort of like a marketing, um, you know, a capitalistic commodity to buy into. But I think uh, there's more to it. Like there's, there's identity building that is a part of it, which translates into like this strange type of existentialism, which is extremely similar to the sorts of like um not just gratification but like uh ontological security one gets participating in other sorts of institutionalized religion right like it it sort of sets out the parameters for what the world's about um it gives you permission uh and and uh feelings of like belonging with other people and navigating what those look like and it gives you sort of like a continuity with the past and the future. So like in a lot of ways, I think, you know, even these things that we like to um, sort of like silo into like, you know, oh, that's sports or like, oh, that's high church. Like, no, these things really bleed out too. And like, just to sort of just to take up with what you're saying there about religion and religious studies. Yeah, like, I mean, for you and I and for others, uh, we see those conversations as inseparable. Like we cannot talk about bodies without talking about power. We can't talk about ecologies and we can't talk about relations without talking about power. And religion like involves all this, right? Like even so-called our religious discourse, right? Like even like secular conversations or like atheistic agnostic conversations, they still involve these things, right? That doesn't mean that they're inherently wrong or they're extremely similar to what they're critiquing it just goes to show that like i think that we have this creaturely condition uh towards a small r religion because we're always caught up in and producing and being affected by these like relations of power yeah yeah <laughs> so to pivot a little bit this got me thinking about your experience Mm -hmm. and all of this and we haven't even talked about belief and how relevant that is but I'm curious about how your feelings about the universe and God concepts have evolved over time you talked you've talked about the trauma of being in this particular evangelical community that you grew mm -hmm. up in but was is there also has there also been some sort of trauma thinking through your metaphysics or thinking through the way that you relate to the world or your, you know, your experience of it. And, yeah. and what, what, or what, are, how are you holding the space of what you grew up with and now what you're thinking today? Um, you know, strangely enough, I have a community that I am a part of that is going through this as well. Uh, we have all come out of that same evangelical Christian high school and in, in grade school. Um, 
that's one of the things I love about social media is that like you can connect with like, you know, all kinds of people. Oh, um, so you're it, like friends on Facebook. You yeah, know? like we're friends on Facebook and we literally have a Facebook group uh, that is like, like sur survivors of this like school experience. Wow. Um, so I don't do it alone, you know, like I do it with other people and like, um, I can definitely say that, you know, like there were things that I think were really personally traumatic for me. Like, um, I mentioned some of the experiences, like seeing my mom marginalized. I, uh, referred a little bit to the child abuse I experienced growing up. Um, but you know what, like some of my friends and colleagues went through so much more than I did. And being a part of that group has really made me cognizant of what those experiences were like for my friends who were queer and for uh, friends who weren't white, um, who didn't come from nuclear families, uh, who like they didn't really fit the mold of like a good evangelical kid um, in a lot of ways and the damage that was done to them. Um, I've seen the way that, they, that they've found like healthy communities to be a part of, or, or they've, they've grown into a confidence of like, accepting who they are for who they are. Um, and that's been really healthy for me. And I've been really privileged to be a part of some of those conversations and, um, you know, patterns of growth. It's a weird thing, evangelicalism. I mean, you know, like, I'm, I'm like, I'm sort of obsessed with, uh, like cults now, like in general, like, I love, like, kind of keeping my thumb on like Scientology and like any type of new um, like cult documentary that comes out on Netflix because I just find it so fascinating that in our modern age where we love to sort of like laud progress and how like rational we are and like how capable we are of making like smart decisions, how like pervasive cults really are and it really starts to like um just show like how irrational like we really are as human beings and like how how we trend towards certain things when we like become parts of like communities that involve power right and i think being a part of like the particular type of evangelicalism i grew up in um it just made me appreciate that it's unique in a lot of ways, but in other ways, like it's very similar to some of the same phenomena happening in all kinds of denominations and in all kinds of like persuasions of religion. Um, so in a weird way, like it was sort of constructive for me too, uh, in, in being able to analyze and critique and appreciate, you know, just sort of the multivalent forms of religion that materialize, you know, and, and how these patterns like sort of repeat themselves often just because like, you know, we're human and like we do human things. And so I, um, I really like doing the study of religion. I really like um, theologizing about this too. You know, like you asked about some of the traumatic things, like, like some of the worldview aspects of the things I grew up in and how that those might have evolved. Um, you know, like I, I went to um, ma my Master's of Divinity in seminary because I had so many questions for things that I needed answers for myself. Mm. Um, and those were theological questions, you know, and, and I'm so glad I did that. I had the opportunity um, to go to a progressive school that really encouraged, uh, you know, strict academic methodology, but like really open theory, you know, and it was, um, it was really good for me because I got, I really had the, the space to explore a lot of these questions and, and nothing was really off limits. Um, and that was weird for me because um, having grown up in that sort of culture, like you're, you're not really allowed to get outside the box, right? Like the whole point is to keep the box safe and intact and pure. Um, and once I got rid of that whole like schematic of like purity, right? Like this sort of like honor, um, culture of like purity um it really opened up so many different things for me um and that's really sort of like where this you know road to finding out these answers for myself like began um 
so like when I do academic work now, like I, I like to put on different hats, you know, like when I do religion and science, I put on my religion and science hat, my study of religion hat. And when I do theology, I put on my theology hat. Like um, for me, it's impossible to like take away like my personal um, ethos or like my, uh, you know, the integral like things that I believe um, that helps shape like who I am and how I operate in the world. But those happen to also align with like, being academically rigorous um, in like a fair way when I'm doing a methodology that's not confessional, you know? And so I haven't had a problem with doing that yet. Um, and I hope never to have that problem, but like, um, I'm so grateful, like to be able to explore things theologically, but also, you know, in a, in a non-theological way too. Mm. So theologically, you mean you would certainly still, uh, you identify as Christian, yeah. I think that's a, it's a complicated question, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> scholar religion. Um, yeah, yeah, I think so. But there's also yeah, I mean, like, something to be said for choosing to own a title or not. That's true. You know, like, like I definitely, I definitely consider myself a Christian. If by Christian you mean a follower of Jesus and someone who uh, is shaped and informed by who Jesus is and what Jesus stands for. Like, I mean, I definitely consider myself a Christian in that sense. I think it's, 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 it becomes really difficult because a lot of people define Christianity on their own terms and in their own experiences. And I think because of my like relationship with evangelicalism growing up, um, I've really grown a hermeneutics of suspicion before I even knew what like feminist theory was, you know, like I'm, I can be kind of cynical sometimes I find, uh, when I look at things that are like sort of taken for granted and not really like critiqued. So, um, you know, like I can't remember who it was that, um, it was an Irish writer who said that he had, um, a lover's quarrel with the world. And that's how I feel about the church. You know, like I have a lover's quarrel with the church and it's like, to me, it's like family where, uh, you love them, but there's thing, nothing at the end of the day that you can really do because um, you're connected and you always will be on some level. You know, like one of the things that I appreciated the most about um, growing into friendships with some of my uh, queer colleagues is uh, the concept of chosen family. And like, that was really important for me. And so in a sense, like I will continually choose the type of uh, church that I want to be a part of but I'm also like I'll never not have those experiences of evangelicalism growing up right and I'll never have like that um removed from the way that I see and feel like the world around me um now that's been like you know sort of challenging for me coming to the United Kingdom because evangelicalism here is completely different than it is in the United States you know here it's it's much more personal pietistic um it's not like married to the culture wars um, and while they do apologetics, just like they did in the churches that I grew up in, um, it's really couched in a completely different way than it is. Um, it's, it's usually couched as a defense rather than an attack. When I grew up, it was an attack of like just exposing why evolution was satanic, like I said earlier, um, and so on. But like, but here it's, it's quite different. And so like I've had to learn how to appreciate evangel evangelicalism here on its own terms. Um, that helped sort of like, push back also about uh, the cynicism that I had and some of the ways that I wasn't um, very fair, I think, to taking those things on on their own terms. So, um, yeah, I mean, like everybody, I'm a work in progress and like I still have faith, I still have hope. And I think at the end of the day, that's all I have. You know, like I have the tradition to work with, but at the end of the day, I have faith and hope and that's all I'm guaranteed. And that I've, I accept that. And to me, there's something beautiful in that. But um, I also understand that that's very much informed by my own personal experiences in history. And, and I want to be able to appreciate that in other people too. Uh, very cool. I'm going to be able to quote you on that. It was very poetic. Um, so the, um, you mentioned, oh, I got caught up in how lovely those sentences were. And I, I got, <laughs> um, you were that wasn't rehearsed, about... I promise. <laughs> I know. Um, so 
these communities, mm -hmm. these evangelical communities. Oh, you mentioned that they're like they're on, they're attacking, and I we have a few minutes left, and I'm going to open up politics, which I know is a mistake with you know just a handful of minutes. But um, do you think that the political? It seems to me a sort of a, a vicious cycle of a sorts. Mm -hmm. The political landscape and the way that this that these kinds of religions, these forms of evangelicalisms and Christianity are practiced, they are, I think perhaps they're in this attacking mode because they feel like they're being attacked. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But then, you know, how do we, how do, do, you, do you think that there is a way that we can break out of this, these cycles of, you know, being, being each other's enemies because people tend to attack when they're feeling defensive and that's that's not a problem here in the uk right but it is in the states and so do we, do we have to make people less defensive like how do we sort of erode the the power structures like we can preserve religious traditions but how do we erode the power structures that make them malicious mm -hmm. i mean that's the six million dollar question right i mean <laughs> yeah i'm sorry go ahead answer it in four it's, minutes. I mean, it's something that i see all the time like i will say like and this is just anecdotally like when I, when I have seen friends who were steeped, like generationally steeped in evangelicalism, when I've seen them leave, it's usually because they've either been so hurt by mm -hmm. the church um, that they can no longer stand it, or um, they travel the world and they get out of that bubble and they see things and they experience things and they meet people um, and empathize with those people in ways that they have never done before, uh, or any combination of both of those things. And, and they, that's what wakes them up, mm -hmm. you know, like, and I, and I've seen friends who, um, have done both and like have kind of adopted really beautiful ways of being agents of healing, like in their communities, mm -hmm. whether that's, you know, in a completely non-church setting or in a church setting. Um, you know, in, in seminary, we had the term wounded healer. And I think that's the way that I look at some of these people. Uh, they, they don't necessarily recognize themselves as, has, as having a vocation, but they're definitely wounded healers. And I think like the world could just do with a lot more empathy. I think it's so important to kind of like, um, look at the experiences of others and like walk in their shoes. And I think all sides of, of debates really need to try to empathize. It doesn't mean that you'll change your mind necessarily. It doesn't mean you're comp that you're compromising like the things that you hold most dear, but I think it really changes the way that we, we operate in the world. And, and man, I mean, I'm preaching to the choir here. So um, this is something that like I've had to struggle with my entire life. Yeah, and I, I will continue to look for ways, you know, I, I have interviewed people on this podcast and, and talked with a lot of people who are trying, working to break down these barriers or uh, mm. make science psychologically accessible to people and, and all these sorts of things. Um, but the, the question of how to open up empathy, you know, the question of how to expose people to these kinds of experiences uh, is is a large one and perhaps in a year we'll speak again and have an answer <laughs> <laughs> for 50 years uh, yeah. presuming the apocalypse has not yet occurred right absolutely <laughs> yeah um okay so this is great we're we're at good timing uh unless there's anything urgent uh you have left you'd like to say or no i just really thank you for allowing me to have the opportunity to talk to you and um yeah thanks again yeah, I, I think this I think this was really beneficial. So that's lovely. Do you have any uh, websites or social media accounts that you can that people can follow or you want people to follow? Definitely, uh, you can check out my profile on academia.edu. Um, that's usually where I post all of my uh, writings, academic and and including you know more popular things like uh, blog posts that I do from time to time. Cool. Um, that's the best way to kind of follow my work. My work as you can probably tell, is quite interdisciplinary. Uh, my doctoral dissertation is in religion and ecology and eco-theology. Um, but uh, because of my background in trauma studies, I'm always looking at sort of these dynamics of power, whether it's through a post-colonial lens, 
um, or through, uh, you know, like the biopower that you and I have talked about. Mm. Yeah, uh, it's interesting. I'm probably one of the few podcasts in the world where the vast majority of guests just tell people go to, to go to academia.edu. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah, all I'll, the nerds we are. <laughs> yeah, so <laughs> I will. Um, I'll provide a I'll provide a link for that too for everybody. Um, so thank you, uh, Tyler, and thank you everybody else uh, for listening. I, of course, you can find me where you always can on uh, stephanieruper.com and the social media sites, and I will. Uh, talk to you next week. Take care.